Okay, so the, actually the first thing I'm going to do is say my name, which is Kathy Tuttle, and I'm the director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, and uh, I asked Joe to come up here to show his movie because we are just in awe of Portland uh, as a city for, for biking. Uh, we're still very jealous of you, and you, the film that you presented gave a, a wonderful history of how Portland got its wonderful infrastructure. And then we showed the short that uh, Bob Edmison up here worked on uh, after the movie, uh, just to show that wonderful things are still happening in Portland. So I'm uh, the director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, which is an advocacy organization for safe, healthy streets. And I'm so happy that the four people here are here as well. And three of these four people came after putting babies to bed, <laughs> which is just amazing. And I think, yeah. <laughs> I actually need to go home after work. I haven't seen my babies <laughs> yet. <laughs> but, but I think that that's a really important kind of thread that's happening now in Seattle uh, bike culture as well, is, is family biking and the strength that families and people on bikes uh, bring bring to the whole bicycle movement. Uh, so just to my left is um, Elizabeth Kiker, who is the executive director of Cascade Bicycle Club, and King, who didn't put a baby to bed, I don't think, <laughs> uh, is, the, uh, is a blogger with Car Free Days. And I'm going to let each of them talk a little bit more about their organizations. I'm going to pass the microphone down. Davy Oil runs the amazing GNO Family Cyclery, <laughs> and uh, Blake Trask is uh, the advocacy director of Washington Bikes and does uh, just a stellar job uh, at the state level making sure that bicycle legislation uh, at least sort of makes an attempt to get passed at the state level. <laughs> so I'm going to just actually hand the microphone down to just let the panelists introduce themselves really quickly, a little bit more. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Kiker, and I'm honored to be here. I'm actually, um, I attend church here, so it's hard to get me away from my family on Friday nights, but when I saw it was at Keystone, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and obviously, I'm passionate about bicycling. I worked at the League of American Bicyclists in Washington, D.C. for about eight years doing federal advocacy. Came here a year ago, and I'm the executive director of the Cascade Bicycle Club, which does events, advocacy, and education in the region. Yeah. And we're working on really collaborating with a lot of the people here. So excited to be here. I'm Ann King, and I write a blog called Car Free Days with my husband, Tim. Um, we started in 2007 when family biking was pretty lonely in Seattle. And it's been really exciting to see it grow. And every day we, we see um, you know, new families riding, and we get really excited. Um, they're not always ex as excited as we are because I think it's more normal now. Um, but still, we like to to call out to other families on bikes. And I also um, have a small bike education and consulting business, and we do mostly one-on-one -on -one consulting, um, trying to get people to try bicycling, try riding to the store, to the park. Um, and sometimes it just takes little baby steps to get people going. We um, have done a series through the library the past couple of years. Um, so and you're doing been, classes tomorrow? Uh, yes, we have a class on Sunday at Beacon Hill. Hi, I'm Davey Oil. Um, and it's funny, I, I didn't know why I was invited to be on this panel. Um, <laughs> because everybody on this panel, like, if I had made a list of like 25 bike influencers who I admire, these people would be in the top part of that list of 25, I guess then I could make it like a list of 10 if they're all in the top part. Um, but uh, the reason why I thought I was on this panel is actually not because I have a bike shop called Gino Family Cycle where we, where we help people get on bikes with their babies primarily, but because I've been to like 100 critical masses, probably 200, and critical mass is my favorite thing in the whole darn world. And uh, I was just very excited to see this film and I'm really honored to be here. Thanks. My name is Blake Trask. I'm the policy director at Washington Bikes, formerly known as the Bicycle Alliance of Washington. We grow bicycling statewide through advocacy and education. We have offices in Seattle and uh, where else? Spokane. <laughs> and uh, and 
I really got my start in Seattle around bicycle issues, served as chair of the city's bicycle advisory board for a couple years, um, and so I'm now on kind of my statewide pilgrimage. But, you know, I think it's been really um, exciting to work statewide to see uh, the interest in bicycling. And my fun fact for folks that think anything in bicycling occurs only in Seattle is uh, which, which city in the state of Washington has the highest commute mode share for bicycling? Any guess? Olympia? Bellingham? Oh, no. Is it Toppenish? Who's, who said Ellensburg? Is what? Ellensburg has the most people commuting by bike of any, like, percentage of commuters of any uh, city in the state of Washington. And so, so you'd be surprised where bicycling is and, and, and is flourishing in the state, and it's something that we really need to keep our eye on um, um, when we work on these issues and talk about these issues. But I am definitely the anti-critical mass, and I think I was just chastised by Davey about three months ago as a customer when I said something about, you know, critical mass, wasn't that nice, now it's gone, and Davey said, no, it's not gone at all. So I'm here to learn. <laughs> well, I, can we, can we, can you hear us from back, back there without a mic? That'd be, that'd be better. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. I, I need to hold, hold on to it. So, so, I mean, this, this is something that I'd like to know more about is the kind of the critical mass versus not critical mass and, uh, you know, what the pluses and minuses are. Because I think right now in Seattle, what we're facing is, um, kind of we're going so slowly in implementing uh, bicycle infrastructure and maybe we do need something a little more out there and so I'd, I'd, I'd like to actually maybe start with you Joe I mean you know from, from from the Portlanders perspective what do you think do we need to, to push a little harder in the in the critical mass vein you, you always need to push harder I mean you you always and you always need people to the left of you I mean that's how Political, any political battle is moved forward, you know, and I think that was in the, you know, I, I interviewed hundreds of people, and the people that had bad associations had very small sample sizes, and I don't know what your case is, Blake, but we, we'll come back. Yeah, we can talk. Right? And, and, and that was really interesting. They said, oh, I went once, and I didn't like it, or I went once, and I felt uncomfortable. And that was sort of the, the tip, and you know, and when I would sort of press it and be like, well, what was it like? What made you uncomfortable? When I would ask like journalistic questions, people would sort of like shirk away from that and be like, well, it's bad. You must accept that it's bad. And I, and I didn't understand why, and I, you know, but then the more I stepped away from it, the more I was able to accept that it was challenging them because it was unlike the sort of political strategy that they were accustomed to, you know, is sort of what I was seeing consistently. And then the people that were of a certain kind of savvy persuasion would, you know, see it as a tool even when they would shun it. You know, they could accept how it would give them a bigger ask. And that was really illuminating for me because I had never thought of any of it this way. You know, I, I was just trying to figure out what the history and the story was. I wasn't trying to see it as a political tool or not. You know, and so I was trying to avoid the question of like, is it good or bad? And now I kind of feel like the, the it is irrelevant. The point is that you would need something perpetually more radical or more extreme or simply to the left of you because it just allows you to be more and more mainstream as an advocate, you know what I mean? And that's sort of where I'm at. That's it, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you think from like a national perspective, Elizabeth? I mean, what, do, we, do we need to get stronger advocacy in Seattle? From a national perspective or a Cascade perspective? Uh, it's up to you. Um, I think nationally, Seattle um, had certainly taken um, wasn't doing as many bold things or as many um, brave things as a lot of cities around the country were doing in unexpected places where Seattle was sort of, bicycling has been a part of the culture and Cascade and other organizations have been really strong here. And there was a time where it didn't seem, at least on a national level, that Seattle it certainly wasn't innovating or setting the stage. And, and if it was falling, it was falling a little more slowly. I think I've seen some really exciting developments over the last year and certainly 
since Seattle neighborhood Greenways has started pushing and working with Cascade and working with Washington Bikes, there's been a lot of exciting momentum and I want to keep that going while also knowing it's always good to have someone kind of shouting and I don't want to leave Blake out there saying it so I do want to just <laughs> also admit that I graduated high school in 1992 and when I watched the movie today with some staff I actually kept thinking wow they really did the police's side of the story at least in Houston Texas was the side of the story that won critical mass was like those anarchists that's not the kind of biking I do and I was so surprised that oh those are my like, they just were all my people, who I would term my people, and I was really surprised because I thought of critical mass as like those anarchists <laughs> or whatever it was. I don't even know what that meant. I I was was like, I'm going to have to defend myself soon. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I, can you wait until I put you on the defensive? Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I just have one thing to say about the word, I mean, the phrase critical mass. I think Seattle could do a lot better to be critical. And I think you get things done when you're more critical. And sometimes I think we're too nice. Yeah. And we take concessions and we just say, oh, thank you for that. That was nice when really we want more. And I think that we could all do better to ask for more or demand more. Absolutely. Are we just going to do this like a? <laughs> um, I do you, do you have? No, no, no. <laughs> um, I think that what Elizabeth, what you just said about uh, the police narrative winning in Seattle in two thousand and seven, we had. Or so, I've been to, like I said earlier, I've been to many, many critical mass rides. Um, I watched critical mass in Seattle grow from fifty people to three hundred, four hundred people during the summer regularly, and sometimes peaking when there were special events. Um, and overwhelmingly, my experience is similar to the more positive stories that you heard in the film. Um, I, I really liked early on when uh, someone that you featured, Joe, uh, talked about how the experience in the ride is nothing but smiles. The, everyone on the sidewalk is cheering. Most of the people who are, who are in cars are cheering or at least waiting patiently. Um, it's just such an incredibly positive experience to participate in, in mo most of the time that I've experienced it. Um, in, to my narrative, that changed in 2007 when the critic, which actually it's funny because it was the first ride I had missed in about five years. I was on my honeymoon and the ride was going right past where I currently live on uh, going by uh, Aloha uh, up uh, through Capitol Hill. And uh, a driver who uh, had been corked, but he was in a parking spot. He wasn't at an intersection, he was in a parking spot. But the ride was creeping up a hill, it was a pretty narrow street, and the ride was take, apparently taking a really long time to get up the hill. This driver is corked. Um, he starts to get impatient. Uh, by the way, I know all this stuff because I did like an interview pro project afterwards to try to figure out what the truth was. And one of my roommates actually is one of the people who gets directly impacted literally by what happens next. Um, uh, a couple of cyclists were standing behind the car to cork it, as you heard about. And uh, this driver's getting more and more... Some of you guys might remember this news story, but it's probably, you probably remember it a little bit differently. Um, so, uh, this driver was getting impatient. He threatened to hit them with his car, so more people stood behind his car, and then he drove over the people uh, who were standing behind him. Um, the first-hand story that I heard from the person who was attached to his, to his windshield was I was attached to his windshield telling him to stop so I could get off his windshield and yelling at him and banging on the windshield. Um, the thing is, what you got to remember here is that the ride is creeping up this really slow hill and there's this weird thing happening halfway up the hill. So up there on 15th Avenue, there's a whole line of drivers who are also being corked by the riders who are trying to help the people get up off this hill and drive on. So what, the, what happens from the people who were then interviewed by the police and the, and the Seattle PI primarily uh, were, was all of a sudden a car comes peeling up the hill behind all these bicyclists who have been making us all wait in our cars and uh, there's somebody attached to his windshield yelling at him. And then that person got off the windshield apparently and punched the driver in the face. Um, this person had just watched his wife be run over by a car by this guy. So uh, that, that I mean, you might remember, I remember the next day, the, that following Sunday I'd come back from my honeymoon and I was on the front page of the PI with my wife uh, with, a, with a big caption that said, uh, what was it? 2007. 2007. Scoff laws is what it says. And what was funny about it is obviously we weren't on that ride, so that was just some stock photo. Um, and that scoff laws, and here's the thing, when we talk about uh, uh, leading from the left, or like leading from the outside, um, I, at the time I worked part-time at Cascade Bicycle Club, um, and I was like the staff dumpster diver. And not, I didn't dumpster dive, I don't mean I dumpster dive for the staff, because they would have all thought that was gross. But I was the person on the staff who dumpster dived. 
Do you know, you know what I mean? Punk. Anyway, so, uh, and, and I remember that, that right after this happened, I called up my friends and people who I worked with, I was a part-time employee, the people I worked with, to ask for, hey, could you help us here? Because there's this crazy news story that says that we're, we're really bad, we're scofflaws. And the guy I was on the phone with said, oh, that word scofflaws came from my interview. Um, and we were just totally thrown under the bus by the mainstream, uh, the more mainstream parts of, of advocacy, black advocacy in Seattle for months. And at, like long after the fact, uh, there was a little bit of a retraction that was done in the Seattle PI. It's actually what closed the newspaper, was that, I'm just kidding. So. <laughs> but what happened, what happened very, very clearly from that moment onward was um, Seattle critical mass rides that were sworn by police, that were, that were I would love to get some of those, those the, the equivalent documents to the stuff that you saw about the budget. Because all of a sudden there were helicopters, there were, there were police, there were police uh, uh, motorcycles cutting into the ride. Um, and then what's interesting is there's a feedback system that happens with protests and cops, right? It, I think part of it is this agent provocateur thing, which I wish we didn't have a French word for because people would, under, would, would be more comfortable talking about it. But, uh, but also, um, it, it attracts people who are like, oh, cool, I, I'm kind of bothered by cops because I'm a new activist or I'm a young person or I, I don't like the mall security guards or whatever. And so I'm going to go to that thing because I hear it's a place to aggro cops. And so there's this feedback system that happens. And so then if you're a new rider who, who heard it was a sweet event because you and I met at a coffee shop one time and I told you it was really fun and positive and then you come and there's a police helicopter and then a bunch of these young activist people who, who want to aggro cops, some of them Asian provocateurs, I guess, um, it just seems like, oh, this is hostile and terrible. And the, ride, and the ride declined and it's been on a steady decline ever since. And I bet if you ask a lot of people, there is no critical mass in Seattle. And that's because sometimes there's like three people and one of them is my baby. Um, <laughs> So that's kind of my narrative of Seattle Critical Mass. <laughs> I don't know if that's not a question. Hey, uh, do you have a request connected with your disappointing experience to us? Uh, everybody should come to Critical Mass on the, 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 let's say, the last Friday of November. It cool. meets, in, meets in Westlake Center, uh, meets at 5.30, leaves at 6. It'll be Buy Nothing Day, too, so it's a great day to us. not buy anything. And, and also, I want to ask everybody to hold questions until afterwards, and then Kathy. Well, that's okay. Kathy, you'll let sure. us know when that time comes. Thanks. I'm sorry. No, you didn't at all. <laughs> also, you're bad. Oh. <laughs> so just to put on my bona fides, I think I did my first critical mass in 1998 in Colorado Springs. So I, I, I actually have participated in this, and only have participated probably half of the Seattle critical mass before. My, my, the thing that Davey attacked me on was more me talking about the epic of critical mass being on the decline, and my sort of not really thought out hypothesis being is that Seattle advocacy or, or maybe bicycling in general has normalized enough to where that type of, I guess, if you want to call it far left or that kind of react, that kind of protest is not necess as necessary or, and that the mainstream advocacy doesn't see it as, as being um, as central to what they're trying to actually achieve. And that's where Davey started to attack me. So, so it's less about, you know, oh, those scary people, they're a bunch of hoodlums and anarchists, and more um, how does it fit in the larger scope of advocacy in Seattle, and is it something that's just been on the decline? But definitely, Davey's right. Um, I think mainstream bike advocacy has said not, has sort of poo-pooed it in the past, and that's been a problem. Well, and I think that that's, I mean, that's why there's still a place for it, right? Because of what we said at the beginning of the panel, that there's still room to push, and there's still room for the radical but perspective. So, so I'm going to sound like a real um, in defense of Seattle in terms of what it's done, in terms of its investments in bicycling, is that when you start to compare Seattle to other cities, Seattle is a pretty complicated place to do new transportation infrastructure. And, you know, I think now that we have a new bicycle master plan and we have the, the um, more the analytics and the actual data that we can start to analyze this, we spent a lot of money on bike infrastructure. The problem is we have crazy topography, we have crazy geography, and consequently the, the, the cost per square everything of, of building trails and things is quite a bit higher than say flat Memphis or any other, a lot of other towns. So what we can actually get for the bang for our buck actually is reduced. So I think there's sort of this, this sense of like, we're not doing it enough or what have you, but then there is the process stuff which we can go down that slippery slope. Come on, Elizabeth. Yeah. All right, two responses. One, um, Cascade Now, if a driver backed into cars and then drove through them, would not say, 
well, those scoff calls were asking for it. I just want that on the record. And um, whether that's at Critical Mass or any other bike ride, we're just right there with you. Um, and then also, I have a particular irritation, though I know you love Seattle and want to depend it, but when people say it's really hard here, I think it's hard in a lot of places. And if you look at me and say, it's harder here than in New York City. I know you said Memphis, not New York City, but like it's the, there are possibilities and bike infrastructure while expensive is so much cheaper than any other infrastructure that I just sometimes get tired of the like, but it's hard, it is hard, it's very worthwhile. And I think Seattle is doing more and can just continue doing more and more. more. So, so one of the things I'm, you know, as an advocate myself and running an advocacy organization, I'm really frustrated by is still the pace of development. I mean, we really want to have a safe city in five years, ten years, and we don't have it yet. And I think one of the pieces that's actually missing is uh, the police. Uh, I think that while we are not attacked by police here, we, we don't have the support of the police uh, doing... Uh, you know, failure to yield laws, vulnerable user laws, 20 mile per hour enforcement. We don't have uh, police kind of standing up for us in a lot of cases where I'd really like to see them standing up for us. And I've just wondered if there are places that we can be pushing that as advocates maybe a little bit more. Any, any comments from you guys? What do you mean by that? What do I mean by push? I mean, ask them to actually enforce, you know, people texting while driving. Um, sure, I mean, yeah, yeah. that's... <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, the vulnerable, sorry, not the vulnerable users, the distracted driving law that was passed in, was it 2010, um, which was the, mo the most recent one that we got passed in Olympia. Um, and we, we led up a lot of that, uh, had, was at an interesting time. Um, and the interesting part about that is that no one had smartphones pre-2010 and didn't really understand how distracted driving would be so like rampant. And, and so it was actually a real hard push to communicate that to legislators. Last year, the Traffic Safety Commission, the Washington State Traffic Safety Commission, uh, uh, dropped legislation which we were very supportive of, uh, which really seeks to strengthen a lot of that. Because we did have a lot of issues where there were uh, different law enforcement agencies across the state which actually really drug their feet on it. They just did not want to enforce this type of thing. So the hope is to strengthen that and that's going to be one of our priority bills this year um, to make sure that you can't be driving and, and talking with, with a phone in your hand, that you can't be checking your email, that you can't be texting, all those things that are right now exempt. Um, that kind of stuff is hopefully going to be strengthened. Um, coming this year, so stay tuned on that. But I'm not going to answer the rest of your stuff right now. <laughs> Is anybody out here oh, want to have some questions? Yeah. Or you, you want to say I have something? A thought, yeah. a thought about policing? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the the acting traffic captain that I talked to, and he was the, not the smartest person for the department to provide to me, but. <laughs> He went as far, I mean, and that was the thing. It was like he was really going off of his recollection and personal opinions in a way that was reckless. And he, but he went as far as saying that he, in his view, bicyclists would not be allowed on major roads because, as he put it, you already got the, the back roads, oh, you know, yeah. meaning that we had bicycle, you know, highways developed on slower moving streets. So he, he literally felt that bicyclists should not be allowed on major streets that had striped lanes and, you know, in some cases, separated infrastructure. And I, I kind of pushed those same questions where I was like, well, if proper enforcement was done unilaterally, you wouldn't have those collisions. You wouldn't have those problems. And this, this was not a favorable thing to say to the man that manages the, the traffic department. Because, in, you know, and that's kind of the thing, is like our entire problem, and I, maybe yours is different, but it's the union is so powerful that you cannot even force them to follow their own rules, you know, and that's been the battle of 25 years, you know, in Portland anyway. Is that similar, comparable? Yes. I mean, yes. 
the, 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 you know, not even their own, you know, so we rotate out the chief every three years or so to make appearances that we can rein in the union because the real problem is that we can't even make them enforce the laws that are on the books. And so it's the things that have been really effective are again the like out of the box solutions like when the judgment was handed down that you couldn't use um, uh, a, a track bike, you know, it would be illegal in the city, the, the literal phrasing of the officer in the trial was a stick would be a better break than riding a track bike. And so they made the, an event for uh, messengers to come out and try using a stick. And, and they promoted it, and it was incredibly effective because it made the police back off, you know. And it, and you know, and, and these are messengers largely who are like, making their literal living by riding their bike and being hassled by police for not being outside of the law, but rather being outside of, you know, two particular downtown uh, patrol officers' perception and interpretation of the law, which was later found to be, you know, not actually the law. But again, it was that like thinking outside of the usual means, you know, and and putting pressure on in less traditional ways that did allow the mainstream advocates to come back and say, you know, we did tell you this and you did ignore us, so maybe now you will listen. And they did. So there's a couple hands up. Yes, right here. My uh, question is regarding the idea that although there's really a lot of nice people riding bicycles, there's still a lot of people who just don't realize that they're not riding bicycles in a high school. This is, uh, you know, city street, and a person has the right to walk on the sidewalk without hearing somebody come up behind one, and then, and then four feet ahead. I mean, I'm talking about walking. So you're talking about bad behavior. There, there are the definitely. No, I'm not talking about bad behavior. They really think that nobody's going to turn around and go what? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so it is like legal to be on sidewalks. Attacked. I mean, I've been attacked by bicycles, and I thought, yeah, I mean, like, I just walked out of my apartment one day, and somebody ran into me in a bicycle, and I thought, whoa. And you know what? He did. He yelled at me, just like a car yells at a bicycle rider. So, you know, so, so there's bad behavior of walkers, bikers, it's and people. It's not bad behavior. Like, they don't know what is possible. This is true with cars as well. Are there, are there other questions? Way in the back here. And also, I want to, because we only have 20 minutes left, I want to be sure our questions are really succinct. So if we utter them, be sure you thought okay, about so them short. Elizabeth has a comment about yeah. that. My question is, what do you do about it? Yeah, and I just, I, I mean, I, I agree with Kathy that there are bad behaviors in every mode of transportation and not clear explanations of the laws. At the same time, um, uh, th there are codes of conduct that most people follow. And there's always the exception, there's always a, a terrible incident, the outliers. And what we need to make sure is that as well as enforcing the code of conduct for drivers, that we're enforcing it for cyclists and that we're enforcing it for pedestrians because cycling on sidewalks is legal here and it's legal with a lot of clarifications mm -hmm. around going the exact same speed as pedestrians and yielding in all instances, and so not shouting, I've got a ride to the sidewalk as I skim by, but, but behaving safely in that environment, and that's something that we're definitely working on. As far as working with police, it's not just saying you need to enforce the cars, it's that you need to enforce the laws for everyone so that everyone knows. Like a lot of, I'm not gonna excuse, and this gets into a tricky area, but like cyclists will run a light to think, okay, I'm gonna get ahead of the traffic, and not have to interact, but the drivers are like, if you're running that light, what else are you doing? You're not listening to anything. And if a cyclist knows, like on the Second Avenue cycle track, I've got a light, I've got a right, I've got a space to the road, then I don't, I don't need to run the light. I, I know I have that space. And so it's making sure everyone has the space and making sure the enforcement is there so that the people who still think I'm gonna run it, just like who's ever sped in a school zone? No one, because A, you want the kids to be safe, and B, the tickets are like a zillion dollars. <laughs> so you want to make sure the enforcement is there for, for that type of issue, as well as the education. I don't know if anyone else had any response. There's a question coming back. Uh, I'm going to ask the question, but I'm about to back up a little bit, because I don't know how many people in the room actually spend time in downtown. Could you, could you 
Can you stand up too, please? Make it a little louder. Thanks. Oh, sorry. There's these bike racks that showed up in downtown, and a whole lot of people were excited at first because it was like, wow, we get to rent it, rent a bike. And, you know, in the downtown environment, it's not really feasible to ride the bike a whole lot because, well, yeah, have you seen the Rice Roni commercial? Yeah, San Francisco, the big incline anyway. But, um, you know, we could, like, strap, rent a bike, strap it to a to a bus and go out to Canada or wherever and whatever. But so, so what, what's your what's your question? Well, when the bikes actually showed up on the racks, we looked at the prices and it's like thirty minutes from station to station, <coughs> and then it just so I, I think ready. you're talking about the new Pronto bikes that are, are downtown and also in the University District, yeah. and they they are they are pretty pricey, but I think they'll they'll help help get more people out on bikes down in the downtown. And I was wondering if those prices were ever going to come. I think there's some reduced reduced price prontos that, that, yeah, I mean, I think there's a special program. I don't know if you, anybody knows about the, I think they have $30 memberships for uh, reduced, reduced fees. Today, I read today $85 a year. Yeah, but I think there's a reduced fee for $35, yeah, is what I heard. For, for, for income levels. For, for low income, yeah. Over here. In Pronto is working with employers. If your employer will help, if, or there are programs with Pronto for your employer to provide you with a substantial discount. So, with, um, so I'm just a guy who rides a bike, and you know, I think there are a lot of people, a lot of my friends want to make our city like Portland or Copenhagen. And what, but what do we do where, you know, like, I mean, you know, these different ways of, you know, but, you know, some of us may become activists, but I think there are a lot of people who are just looking for, okay, what did, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to do something. What do I do? I think that we can start small. And I think that we shouldn't compare ourselves to Portland. We, we like to do that here. And we are not Portland. Um, Seattle is a much more corporate city than Portland. It's much more big business. And I think if we stop comparing ourselves, um, we, might, we might get farther. And, the, and I just wanted to say one more thing about um, starting. Starting small is a, is a good way to start biking. Get a bike and use it in your neighborhood and get comfortable. I'm not asking about how to start biking. I'm asking how do we make this happen? How do we as citizens affect policy? You know, what's the best way? What, you know, your one or two things to, to take action. What should we do? Okay, I'm going to follow up just quickly in my, my defense of Seattle again, which is I, I think we're about 12 years behind Portland. I mean, we got t started really 12 years behind in terms of a lot of this investment um, that's trying to make us like a Copenhagen or a Netherlands, which is yet again another 30 to 40 years ahead of Portland. So it's all in a continuum, and I think that's why I'm sort of saying we shouldn't necessarily beat ourselves up. Um, we're following along that path. Vancouver took a different path than Portland. We're taking maybe more of a middle path. We, frankly, I think have more of a grassroots initiative around uh, neighborhood greenways. And, um, and I think that that's really exciting and it's something that where I think we're actually really ahead of Portland. Maybe I, I could be t told wrong about that. That was a very top-down initiative uh, that f led by really great people. Uh, but here, everyone here said, why can't we do what Portland is doing? And the framing that Kathy and others at Seattle Neighborhood Greenways, uh, 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 have what they kind of, I guess, embraced and engaged in, in, in Seattle, uh, I think is one of those places where you can see an open door towards working with Seattle Neighborhood Greenways and with the Neighborhood Greenway groups that are all over the city. And it's one of the most, I think, exciting organic ways to just get involved and sit down in a meeting. Um, there's all sorts of wonky ways to get involved. The comp plan is right now. Um, you can sit down with your neighborhood council and be a part of that and say, you know what, bicycling is really important. I've been involved in this for seven or eight years. and I actually think that I'm now a new advocate because I am a proud new owner of a family bike from Davy, 
And it really has opened my eyes to the differences that, that, that I engage in, in my normal bicycling and bike advocacy to now thinking about what is it like to take my 16-month-old and my four-year-old on a bike, on bike lanes and things like that. How do I park at PCC when they have these coat hanger racks that I can't <laughs> lock up anymore? Um, all those types of things, there's just all these different nuances. So you have to figure out what's authentic to you and what makes most sense and where you fit and, and go for it. I just want to echo the part about authenticity to yourself. That I feel like we can, we can you know, join a mailing list for one of these great organizations and, and see when their volunteer opportunities are and then participate. And that's a great thing to do if you have time. But I have a good friend over there who's a, who's a strong activist who's also involved in a, in a, in a school board fight in his, own, in his own school board. And, you, and you're parking at your own grocery store in your own, I think that what, like the biggest, most important way that we can make improvements is to consider who are our cohort and what are their concerns and how does transportation intersect with their concerns or our own concerns. Um, I think if we all strive to do that, then we can recognize our neighbors and then maybe we can get at something nice that the bicycle movement sometimes misses but is, but is now luckily um, rising to the forefront of at least how we talk about ourselves and that's a social justice intersection. That if we, can, if we can figure out who our cohort are, who our neighbors are, and what their concerns are, not always looking for the ones that happen to line up with our own personal bicycle goals or the bicycle goals that we saw identified in a book about bicycling or in what looks like Copenhagen, but instead think about, oh, you know, the South End needs to be a safer place. And one of the problems is that Rainier, Rainier Avenue keeps killing people. Like maybe we could all work together to make, because we all care about traffic safety, we could work on intersections in Rainier Avenue. I'm just thinking of something. Does that make sense? I loved all those answers, and I do also just want to add, you can just take a friend on a ride with you that doesn't know, or, you know, because you're a guy that rides a bike, which is already something great, and then um, that's how I got started. Someone said you could ride to work, and I'm like, I can't ride to work. I live there, and I work here. <laughs> and they said, I'll meet you on the trail tomorrow morning, and I was like, really? And here I am 15 years later. So it doesn't need to be a big start. My new form of bike advocacy is literally taking my kids on a bike ride and showing people that that's possible, that that's something that's allowable. Um, and I really do feel like that's my new exciting bike advocate thing. And it could be as simple as that. And, and that's something I, I mean, I kind of deliberately invited people with little kids too. That was because I really do think that, that family biking is one of the real keys to unlocking what's, what's going to happen next because you change your, your whole way of biking when you have a child with you. You become a, a different kind of, of biker and you, you have a much higher expectation of safety. You become a baby again. You become like a new cyclist again. Hills are a challenge again. Every time someone opens a car, I've said this a million times, but like every time someone opens a car door three blocks away from you, you you're just like the first week you rode a bicycle where that really offended you. Every single thing that can happen, every single concern that a new cyclist has, you, you're going to revisit again when you put your babies on your bike. So there, there's a, a lot of hands up. So, Shannon, did you? Um, yes, I um, just wanted to say that uh, the ramifications of misbehavior on the part of cyclists and rule infractions on the part of cyclists has nowhere near the impact as a 4,000-pound vehicle. And I think that's one of the most important things to remember, where the car, the drivers in general do not equate those different, the weights of the vehicles, and, um, Still, if you get hit by a bicycle, it's just as frightening. No, well, it might not kill you, but it's... I don't think so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, don't get, I hope you've gone. never been run over by a bicycle. And not to excuse any of it, yeah. but it is not even comparable. It's not even comparable. And cyclists really get a bad rap. I'm almost 60 years into it, folks. I haven't driven since 1970. 76. So I love every moment of it, I can tell you. And you don't, you, you, the bicyclists are exposed to all kinds of crap. The cars, yeah. most of what they do is hidden. And so it's a whole different ball game. And these drivers are totally over-identifying with their vehicles as if they're part of their identity. That does not happen with cyclists. I definitely associate with my bicycle with like that. I'm surprised I leave it alone at night. But that's exactly what it's doing. So, Tim, I identify with this chair. Oh, me. It doesn't yeah. So, um, 
but that, that, I mean, it's hard to follow since 1976, but I was going to say baby with, you know, with, with kids and Blake, you're riding with kids. And, you know, Anna and I started this in 2007 with our kids, our son was three and a half, riding on our extra cycle, and there was nobody out there. And now he's in middle school, and it's still not safe for him to ride to middle school. Yeah. And yes, today, on the way to school and on the way home from school, we just about got squashed. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to know is, you know, and then, Davey, also you got the point about, about the, if someone opens a car door in front of you. Well, once your kids start riding on their own, it's that same thing all over again. It's this constant mm -hmm. cycle. Uh -huh. And so what I want to know is, do we need somebody in Seattle to sue somebody yeah. to get yeah. things going yeah. faster? Is yeah. there a need for that? And I, you know, <coughs> BTA was saying, well, critical mass helped because they were to the left of BTA. And, you know, I would say that, that, and no offense to either of your groups, but BTA is to the left of both of your groups. You're closer to, to like, the Seattle-style thing. And so what, what does that look like? Maybe that's why Critical Mass kind of got the bad vibe here, because it was getting its growth right around the time that we were, you know, building Nike Town and turning the Coliseum into a Banana Republic and stuff. <laughs> and, and so, I, you know, I don't know. Is there something to the right of Critical Mass that is going to be to the left of everything else that we're doing can act, act as a foil? Because I really feel like we need something there. But our groups have been so successful, you know, the big groups have been so successful and have so many members that there isn't really room for that other thing. So the question is, should we sue for safer streets? Yes. And do we need yeah, do we need that? Is that the, the solution to speed things up? Because frankly, I'm sick and tired of the fact that my kids have been riding since they were tiny, and they were passengers, and you know, my daughter's two years away from her driver's license. So what, and I still can't send her to ride around the city. What's going on? How old is she? I think, yeah, I think, I think everybody up on this stage is probably a little frustrated with the speed of implementation. Well, maybe not. Is that, are you? I, I'm no, not you're not. Okay, we're not, okay. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, are you? I mean, I've been here a year, so I, the historical, I know that Cascade has been involved in lawsuits. Who, who's been here? Is Robin still here? No, crap. My oh, staff. Yeah, so we're back. Uh, we sued PSRC two years ago, and then we sued. And we lost. I understand we lost, but there are lawsuits that have happened. I'm not sure that lawsuits, I'm not sure we're going to sue our way to better infrastructure. I understand it's part of the irritation, and you weren't asking what Cascade said. Right. You were asking is someone to the left, so. Yeah. Um, well, I'm someone to the left, and I'm actually literally to the left, and I'm from Seattle. So I'm going to get, get from Joe. Um, pass it to the left, bro. We're, it's 2014. We can always pass things to the left. Um, that was a pot joke. Uh, I, uh, I mean, where I sit every day, it's, I'm surrounded by, uh, my mom, by moms and babies, and uh, I'm an anarchist, and I get to help people get on bikes. And I see, like, I see so many discussions about the, the like people whose eyes have just been opened to the joy. Like Tim, when you talk about how frustrated you are and how it's been since two thousand and seven, mm -hmm. and you're like, remember how great it felt, even though you guys were so alone in two thousand and seven, and remember how many people every day are picking up handlebars, and how many people every day are, are just getting started riding and experiencing that joy, despite all of this crap, despite. Cops not, not, not enforcing laws despite a bus driver turning across a bike, a, a, a bike lane in front of you and then yelling at you. Despite every single fight we have, like that, that, I don't, like that, that pleasure that people are getting the first time today. Somebody, by, even though it was raining, they were like, well, I committed to doing it on Friday, so I'm just going to do it. And I get to see that, I get to see that every day, and that's, that, that feels to me like inevitability. And that, and that once Officer Make I Hate Bikes is, you know, is, is, is helping his daughter equip her bike for her first commute to, to, to middle school, I don't know. He's probably going to be a little bit more friendly before he Billy clubs you. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, well, so I don't even know if it always requires something... I'm sounding like a really big centrist in this whole conversation, but... Um, You're fine. I, there's so much that we haven't done even in the, in the center of this conversation. Um, Davey's going to tell me what, what critical mass has done around um, law enforcement and its engagement of law enforcement. 
but quite frankly, in my years, whether it's with the advisory board or watching Cascade or watching Washington Bikes, I haven't seen really um, any deep engagement with Seattle Police Department. I frankly haven't. So, so for me, a lot of my advocacy comes from the fact that, yes, we do need a spectrum. And sometimes we need a good cop and sometimes we need a bad cop. But there's so much that we just haven't done. We haven't even showed up in the room. Um, we, we, haven't, we don't have the depth and we think, oh, we have Cascade and we have Washington Bikes and Neighborhood Greenways, but it's still not enough. And um, my really quick anecdote is working on the state revenue package in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we would all love to have hundreds of millions of dollars for biking and walking, but then you actually have to ask yourself statewide, if we had hundreds of millions of dollars, could we actually handle hundreds of millions of dollars? Do we actually have the designs and the projects? We have all these things in our head about being Copenhagen, but we haven't actually done the real work to get that done. We haven't had the conversations with SPD. We haven't had the, we don't have project shovel ready projects. So there's just so much more just to do just with what we have. And that's a fundamental issue. Um, that I see in my work on a daily basis. Okay, Joe really has been very antsy. Many people are wanting to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's She'll deal with time. it. There's two people. Yeah. She'll deal with it. Yeah. So to, to your question and your point, so I kind of, because they're, partly because the reputation is pretty sorted, I, I, I did a pretty good polish on the BTA because they were interesting for the very first five years, mostly in that they were so politically savvy. And um, Ed Blumenauer had actually opposed all the bicycle development in the 90s. And that is now his legacy, is being the guy that built all that stuff. And it was the same way with the governor in the 70s. You know, I mean, he wasn't the one that was like, I have all these brilliant ideas. He was, you know, outmaneuvered politically. I mean, it's really like House of Cards kind of stuff in both cases. And, and then the BTA sort of fell into irrelevance pretty much five years later and lost all that innovative edge when they lost Rex. You know, he went, he works in city government, he works for the Metro Council now. And, and now he's moving into like international energy policy, which is a great place, but it doesn't do much for Portland. So I would say, you know, I mean, and, and those, you know, turning Ed 180 degrees on that, where he now is the congressional bicycle guy from the place of opposing, following the, you know, the 1% law that we, we passed in the 70s. I would say that is the kind of things you want to look towards when you're talking about radical changes and, you know, how do we make this motion happen? I mean, it's that kind of, it's the stuff that happens outside of the boardroom, but changes what happens in the boardroom. I want to acknowledge we're at 9.30. Are you all okay for another five or six minutes or so? Yeah. Are you all okay for another five or six minutes or so? Yeah. Okay. Four hours. Okay, so there, there are two questions in the back. We're going to take the two questions and then we're going to wrap up the panel. So, uh, way in the back and then way in the back. Yeah, just, um, I don't know, recommendation. You can tell me what you think of this, but like you're going to have more clout the more people you get behind and you've got to get allies. But there's no discussion of like, you know, uh, working with say, you know, transit riders or something like that. I mean, we need more public transportation. That'll actually help get more cars off the road. But even something like say, you know, housing justice, because like if, if you know, you've got prices going out the roof in the city, if you force people to move to say Everett and they're working, you know, downtown, they're not gonna commute by bicycle that long, you know? So in other words, things like, you know, housing, costs are going to have an effect on your issue. So I'm wondering, like, you know, oh, you thought right. about synergies here? To... Uh, you're absolutely right. We just, we just uh, got uh, some, uh, something called the Bullet Foundation gave us a big grant. Not a big grant, a very small grant. <laughs> to, to, to work together with uh, Puget Sound Sage, FutureWise, One America, uh, and a lot of the transportation advocacy groups. Transportation Choices Coalition. Uh, Cascade Bicycle, Feet Seattle Feet Neighborhood Feet First, Feet Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Uh, we're all on uh, Washington bikes, of course, uh, and we're, we're all working together to try to build a coalition exactly like you're talking about. So yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Yes. 
Well, another idea I have thought about, about expanding bicycle ridership would be to get employers, major employers involved in the following way, because a lot of people don't ride their bike to work because they don't want to be all sweaty. Yeah. So if you give tax breaks to employers who install showers in their workplaces, maybe I think I could that I considerably could see how that could expand ridership because a lot of people are, you know they don't want to be right. going to work all sweaty. Uh, what do you think of that idea? Put electric motor on them. <laughs> tax, tax breaks are a great idea, and Earl Blumenauer has helped with the tax break federally. Um, it's a complicated process to get taxes, but we, uh, I mean, at Cascade, and I know Washington Bikes says too, across the state, works to encourage employers. We always encourage showers. There's lots of ways to encourage bicycle-friendly employers, and it's a huge um, way to get, I, I believe um, a lot of the employers are um, have been instrumental in for example, the bridge across 520 being bicycle friendly, a lot of that was pressure from corporations on the east side as well as from advocates. So so we're definitely trying to get more. We're working in all the ways. Not all, We don't have all the answers, but a lot of, like, we're trying lots of different things to see what sticks because to really transform, you got to try lots of different things, not just not just one. And Elizabeth mentioned there's a woman right there who had her hand up. Just a brief question. That is, I'm also concerned about where would I take like a beginning novice biker child, maybe four years old, who just you know has just had the training in the wheels taken off. There's where some people I... sitting right in front of you that can answer that. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, Anne, I'm sorry. Yes, but 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 there's also the Seattle Family Biking is right here as well. Is there a written resource? Do but any of these organizations have yeah. information on trails? There are a number of groups in Seattle that encourage family biking. <laughs> and Sorry. one great way is to just take your child to the park or take your child to a schoolyard and look for other kids in the neighborhood who ride. Um, another great city resource, just this year, there are um, Play Street permits and neighborhoods can apply for these permits to close their street. Um, and you can apply for, I, I think our neighborhood applied for all the home Husky games because they were tired of <laughs> the Husky traffic going through the neighborhood. And they closed down the street and the kids can bike in the street. Um, so it helps to talk to your neighbors or talk to other people with the kids. Well, I know the Sammamish bicycle lane and tr you know, trail mm -hmm. over this by the Sammamish <coughs> River is really great, except for the fact that really fast bicyclers yeah. come zooming by trails and are, little kids that are just yeah. still trails walking. Trails are not kid friendly. Not true. They're, not true. People ride too fast. There's um, people with dogs, and, and yeah. that's really not a safe place to take a child. Or a dog or a cat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would like to encourage families to go on the Bicycle Sundays along Seward Park. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful area. And uh, it's great to see the family. The little one. So, so I think we're about to wrap up. But before we do, I want each person to say their name, their group, just because you might have forgotten by now. And, and then also, uh, you know, what kind of a biking city Seattle will be in five years? And, yes. and uh, how to get hold of them, how to get involved. Yes. If you have organizations that you mm -hmm. want yes. people to be involved with, yeah. how do they get hold of you? So I'm Joe Beal, and the film is Aftermath, Bicycling in a Post-Critical Mass Portland. And I am actually, the thing that impressed me the most about Seattle is the structuring of the, the way the Greenways projects are arranged in that they are autonomous, uh, neighborhood-based volunteer organizations, which gives them a lot more flexibility and political motivations. And I think they would be, I'm most excited to see what they can do to the city in five years, because all the, the, the stories about what um, Phyllis did in South Seattle with the like ad hoc um, guerrilla separated cycle track, like that's the kind of stuff, I mean, when maybe it's just my, what interests me, you know. <laughs> But I think that will have the greatest net impact. And, um, and I have a website at uh, mikeyourcosmpublishing.com slash aftermaths where you can like, watch all the things and get the stuff and you know, <laughs> email me if, that is, if you have a reason to do that. And you can buy the film That's right. and swag. And, and beautiful t-shirts. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm, I'm Kathy Tuttle. I'm the director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet over there. Uh, and five years from, and we're at seattlegreenways.org. And five years from now, I think, I think we're just on the cusp of really making some really big changes and that we will be, at least in kind of the core of the city, kind of a, you know, maybe not all the way to the very south end of West Seattle and the very north end of Lake City, but I think we really will be in a city that you can get from one end of the city to the other on safe streets. Uh, I, I really do believe that in five years, we're, we're really building this groundswell, and I think we're going to be able to, to get actually jump jump over Portland. Ooh, I'm excited <laughs> about that. So Kathy, Kathy stole, my total, uh, stole my thunder. I'm Elizabeth Kiker with Cascade Bicycle Club, Cascade.org. And I think Blake mentioned um, Portland got started about 15 years before Seattle and the Netherlands 30 years before that. Um, but what we've seen in other cities in New York, in Sevilla, Spain, that timeline is shrinking, and you can transform a city in five years, and we are going to be way ahead of Portland five years from now. <laughs> Seattle is poised and ready to go, and we've got families riding everywhere. This is from the woman who said, don't compare Portland, right? <laughs> well, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Wait until you're ahead. And I'm Ann King, and I write a blog called Car Free Days. I can be reached through the blog. And my kids are now 11 and 13. So in five years, I'll have a 16-year-old wow. and an 18-year-old. And Davey will have a... A 9-year-old and a 6-year-old. A 9-year-old and a 6-year-old. So I hope in five years that Davey's kids can bike to middle school and he won't have to worry about them. I mean, he won't have to ride with them. They'll just be able to go by themselves. Uh, that sounds awesome. My name's Davey Oil. Uh, I co-own a shop called Gillies and Oil Family Cycle Re. We're in Greenwood. Um, you can find us on the internet at familycyclery.com uh, and I write a blog there too. Uh, and in five years, um, I think Seattle's going to be one of those places where uh, after you move to Seattle, you look around and realize that you don't have a bike and you, you don't feel cool or you can't tra possibly tra travel with your friends. Um, so I think Seattle's going to be one of those places where, where bicycling is just assumed to be one of the things that you do, regardless of your age. And survive. <laughs> I'm Blake Trask. I'm the policy director at Washington Bikes. You can reach us at uh, lawbikes.org. And um, I, I think uh, really it's just been probably the last year to two years where the city has really, I think, aligned itself to really move forward on a lot of this. And the thing that I do say, again, you know, pushing for Seattle is that institutionally, I think we just, it's taken a long, long time to align us in the right place uh, to build the right infrastructure. And I think now we're gonna start really seeing some of that stuff kind of roll out. And that's really exciting. But I think larger than that, we just need to be continuing to think about um, that I, I hope in five years that we, we think more about streets as for people, um, that we continue to think about these larger framing conversations about, um, uh, about safety, that car accidents aren't accidents necessarily, they're collisions, they're crashes, um, and that we continue to, to create, I think, a more a balanced transportation system um, all around. Well, I want to thank this amazing panel, please. Thank you all. And I want to thank for the great questions, too, and the great uh, interaction.